going on guys? Don't be like late here. Welcome back to another video. Now in today's video, we're going to be going over a couple couple things in this video. Two major things I want to talk about with the new VGC rules and some new updates to the channel, some new content that might be coming out. Uh, but before then, if you're hyped for another video on the channel that uh, you guys thought was dead, but it's actually not dead. I just took a long hiatus. Leave a like down below, subscribe for more future content. And let me know what your thoughts are on Series 12. I'm interested to see if you guys like it or not. I am personally a very, very, very huge fan of Series 12. Um, but I do have some things I'm going to go over today. Uh, an update for the channel. Uh, the reason why I've been kind of inactive is because, I guess over the past few months, uh, not, there wasn't that many tournaments going on with Season 11. And a lot of, I had a lot of stuff going on with uh, work and then getting my Eagle Scouts. Um... Uh, getting my Eagle Scout together, which I actually I, I actually am now an Eagle Scout, so that's a it's an accomplishment, but it's also like something that I can check off my list of things that I am busy with, so I'm less busy than before, which is just really nice. I do have a lot more free time now, so I'm very happy about that. Um, but also, Series 11 was just really boring. I was not able to find a team that I liked. Laddering, I just found wasn't as enjoyable as I uh, as it was as it used to be. I guess I was able to deal with Season 6 a lot better, uh, even though Season 6 I still consider the worst. I think Season 6 I was able to deal with a lot better just because it was over quarantine, so I didn't really have much else to do. But now I have school. You know, I uh, spent two hours studying for finals today. Um, so I have more stuff going on in my life than uh, before previously during quarantine. So it's like I gotta, I don't know, spending the time after VGC feels like I need to uh, weigh whether it's actually something I want to do or not. And this time they came out with an absolute banner of a rule set. Um, I mean, it's a very simple, simple rule set. It's a GS Cup format, so you can have two restricteds. Uh, something like a Kyogre, a Xerneas, a Groudon, a Zacian. You can have two of those Pokemon on your team, and Dynamax is also allowed. Now, this seems like actually it would be a very, very power-heavy format, and it can be, but honestly, I've found that it's not as power-heavy. I mean, it's very power-heavy, but it's not too overwhelming. Um, I think it's very overwhelming, can be overwhelming to some people that aren't as familiar with it. But I think overall it's just very, very, very solid, and I like it a lot. So I want to go over uh, two things today. Uh, yeah, two major topics. I, d I did my little update video, and I will try to be more consistent with posting content. I will try. I'm not. Ex I don't know if I'll live up to that promise. Consistent might mean once per week, once per two weeks. I don't know. Maybe back to how I used to do it in like ultra series. Maybe once per month. Although I don't think I would do once per month. I think maybe once or once. I don't know once maybe every once every week or two weeks something like that i want to do semi-consistent content again uh not like super crazy like i used to do over quarantine where i used to like upload daily for an extended amount of time that's that's just crazy i don't feel like putting in that much allocating that much time I mean, i'm doing other things i'm playing persona 5 royal which takes a crap ton of time also have other stuff i want to do uh so I, I don't think i'm going to do that but I do want to bring somewhat consistent content to you guys because I actually think, um, especially since we're probably going to be having a lot more online tournaments again, as it seems like COVID is just going to screw over the um, in-person uh, TPCI events again in our uh, Shots for Worlds. I think it's important that the community comes together and tries to build up, build up as much I push the content out there as much as possible over these prolonged periods of time where we're not going to have... I guess the spotlight that we should have had uh, without COVID. So I'm going to try to do my part, uh, do my part in pushing some content out there, hopefully trying to get people interested. Okay, there are two things I want to talk about today. The first is that I am finally involved with a draft league. There have been two drafts I have applied for previously. There was the VGC Pinnacle draft, which I don't even know what the heck became of that. I don't know if that was a thing. But they had a last last chance qualifier, and I did it with my one friend, and we technically qualified, but we didn't ever get scouted by a team because we were seniors at the time. So I mean, why are you gonna pick up a senior that's only accomplishment is getting top four at a regional with 14 people? Like it just doesn't make sense when you could pick up a master player that's definitely more experienced and has, I guess, more experience against higher level players. I mean, it just it makes more sense to pick up the masters player at that point. So we didn't get. We did not get drafted there. And then I applied for the NPA. Um, I think it was NPA season nine. Season season nine or ten. And NPA is the National Pokemon Association. I think it's the largest VGC draft league. Um, and that was really scuffed. That was uh, really rigged. 
because my accomplishments, if you can see in front of your screen, um, that you have to, when you apply, you say, you know, what's your name? You say, uh, what country you're from? So we can put you on team us, team Ireland, team Greece, something like that. Um, what are your accomplishments? That way the uh, team United States can assess whether you, they think would, you would be good on the team or not. And some players have a long list of accomplishments, like a couple top eight at regionals. Oh, what did get? Oh, dude, I got a text message from Ohio University. Let's go, baby. It's nothing important, though. Um, but they'll have, like, uh, multiple regional finishes and maybe, like, a top cut an online tournament or two. And, obviously, those players are going to get in because they have shown that they are consistent good players. And then you have some other players that are really new, but um, have, like, one very, very minor accomplishment, but get in because they are close a close knit with other people um and fortunately i have a life so i'm not like so close knit into the community that i spend all my waking hours in the community i actually do i do stuff outside of pokemon surprisingly um so i'm not that close knit in the community and i mean i am with a couple people but to me that doesn't really matter i don't care all that much um but it seems like p players that actually have more more proven skill uh, did not get in but players that just had pure connections got in Let, let's let's think about it this way there is a player that had i think really one small minor accomplishment maybe like top cut uh like a 54 player tournament and was relatively new uh, i mean if you're relatively new and you top cut a 54 player tournament that's not bad like that means you're probably gonna be a pretty good player in the future but i wouldn't pick i wouldn't if i was a team member i wouldn't pick you up right from there and they got scouted by a team but Nantaro did not get picked up by any team. And if you guys do not know who Nantaro is, let me just let me just paint you a picture here. Let's see if I can actually find him. Nantaro, here we go. Nantaro. He is the Thailand Thailand Players Cup champion. He got first in the VGC ladder. He's the 2015 Brazil official online champion. He's the 2020 VGC Singapore official trial champion consistently gets over 2000 on vgc ladder uh has got a, i think first place on ladder for six years now and did not get picked up by a team what but a, but a newbie but a newbie with like one minor result got picked up but he didn't like that makes absolutely no sense to me i applied with my list of accomplishments you can see here i thought i was going to get in i thought i had a shot but of course i didn't get in because i think that the draft league is extremely base. Now I get it. I mean, that's a decent resume, but I mean, it could it could be better. It could be better. So I'm still working on that. So I didn't get into that draft league, and so honestly, my opinion of draft leagues at this point, we're like, I, I doubt I'm gonna get in. I'm going to apply. I know MPA is doing another one. I'm going to apply again, but I my opinion on draft leagues is gonna stay the same. I just I think they're a bit of a bit bit, bit rigged, you know, because like what. I, I feel like that was a bit rigged, so I was surprised that I got picked up for this one draft league that I'm a part of. It's called the uh, USPA Draft League. Um, yeah, U United States Pokemon Association. It's a VCC Draft League. They have 2018 spinning the United States. One team from, or 2016 from the 26 teams from the United States. One for the U.S. territories and one for Canada. So 28 teams in total. Um, we have they're separated into four flights with seven teams in each. Is a seven-week draft, and I got picked. I was picked uh, for the Pennsylvania team, so I'm very happy. And right now we are in week two. We have a bye week two, but we won uh, week one against Puerto Rico. I might make a video talking about analyzing each week because I did. We did win against Puerto Rico, and I did win my week one match. But I won it off of luck, so I won it off a of double protect. So I don't feel as good if I were to just win it based upon super good play. So I definitely have a lot to improve there. But uh, if we're talking about our team, we actually have a pretty strong team. Um, some pretty good notable players are Painty. He's a pretty good locals player, as well as Eclipse Al. They never do poorly. I don't know about the rest of these people, except the Charisma. I know Charisma. Uh, I, I've never seen him at locals, I don't think. But I know he's a, I know he's a good online player. Has done well in some uh, online events. So um, I'm excited to see what comes with this. Also, this is a pretty big league. Uh, a lot of people applied for this, so it's not something very small. It's actually something pretty, pretty big. You know, I mean, 38 likes for uh, VGC is pretty good. All right, next thing I want to talk about. 
as we're seeing series 12 progress there's been a lot of progress that has been done in the metagame and one of the biggest tournaments in vgc history happened over this weekend oh also subscribe to route one podcast it's a really good series uh with uh Mer- mercury mercury moxie boosted atrix mj and aspen vgc all all really cool people really fun podcasts really cool to listen to so yeah go sub to them please really awesome podcast thank you guys anyways we're gonna get into the victory road tournament so victory road always hosts tournaments and the tournaments that they host normally always have pretty big uh, numbers that attend i mean if you look at the world cup open that happened july 24th 405 players i mean they consistently get basically over 100 players for the most part um in in, in basically any of their tournaments um 100, 170, ranging from like low hundreds to mid hundreds, and then some really spike and go 400 and stuff like that. But this time, we had a 544 player tournament. 544 players. Now I want I want to put this in perspective. At least in recent history, I know Nugget Bridge held some majors in the uh, long ago in like 2015, 2013, something like that, that had around 1,300 players. But in recent memory, there are only a few tournaments that I can think of that have had more than 500. Um, When we're talking real life events, it's Dallas Regionals. And this event was bigger than Dallas Regionals 2020. Dallas had 508 players. I know there was um, the Champions Cup that had 1,500, which was absolutely insane. That was the biggest uh, tournament in VGC history, I believe. I could be wrong, but I think it is the biggest tournament in VGC history. Um, and then there was there was another tournament where I know first place. Wolfie well, made a video on it, where first place had ran a mono water team, but it was actually Urshi Dark. I forget that, but it was like some Korean tournament. I, f- I forget exactly what it was. That had like eight hundred some players, a thousand. God, my throat is dry. I need water. But, I mean, that was a year ago when the uh, hype for Sword and Shield was at its peak. When it just came out. And, you know, even going over to the summer in quarantine. You know, Sword and Shield was still relatively new. VGC was still relatively in the spotlight. So, you know. Yeah, VGC was relatively new in the spotlight. So, you know, we still had that initial, I guess, initial push. From the uh, VGC regionals held in 2020, um, because like these these VGC regionals in 2020 really helped booster the popularity of VGC. Because in um, prior to 2020, we've been getting we've been getting like a hundred, um, a hundred people at most for regional. Then Dallas hit, and we had 508, and it was like the resurgence of VGC, the revival of what we thought was declining. When Dallas, I think Dallas, no no no, when Daytona. When Daytona Regionals in 2019 hit 36 players, we thought it was over. We thought VGC was dead. 36 for a VGC Masters Regional is pathetic. It is the worst that I have ever witnessed. So, I thought it was over. Uh, but, Sword and Shield carried this momentum and that travel that carried over into quarantine. So, a lot of people were still playing in quarantine just because they didn't have anything else to do. A lot of people still were interested in VGC. And so, we saw a lot of uh, like 300, 400 player tournaments. Uh, because people had a lot of interest, but as he, as the months have gone by and as people have started re- started to get out of quarantine and return to regular lives, um, people aren't as interested in VGC uh, now because the just the years have gone by. The game is not as new as it used to be. VGC is not as new, so to see a tournament like this hit such a high mark is just absolutely absolutely insane to me. Um, I I mean I'm just absolutely so surprised. I can't believe it did this well. <laughs> Uh, we have 544 players now they did advertise a prize pool and it was free and it was sponsored by gg gator i think a company that organizes um it's a company that organizes other esports events so they did have a lot of help they did have a lot of promotion with this so that also could have helped but i mean 544 players i just want to illustrate how massive this is in the vgc scene we're not the biggest esport i don't even know if i consider vgc an esport um but this is this is one of the biggest Pokemon tournaments, and um, I played in it. Now I'm going to talk about leading up to this tournament. I did a bunch of practice games within like four days. I just stayed up 
stayed up uh, late one night and I probably played for seven hours, eight hours straight, just grinding, I'm sending matchups and whatnot because I really wanted to do well in some of these tournaments. Um, and so I just kept on grinding, grinding, understanding um, the metagame and trying to get more comfortable as I was getting back into VGC um, and because I really wanted to do well in this tournament. So this day came and I played in this tournament and I want to say something. So there were nine rounds in this tournament for you to make top cut, which was top 41 players out of 544, you had to at least win seven times, seven times, which is just insane for you to make top 32 in this tournament, you had to win at least eight times so think about this um imagine how hard it is this is one of the biggest tournaments in history a lot of really good players i mean i could go to the bracket and explain the the players but i mean players like il mule a, a very a lot of good italian players i mean just players that are so so good no matter where you look at it like players the, some of the best players from their country best french players best italian players best american players best spanish players just all across the world, best Japanese players. Everyone was playing in this. There was a lot of good competition. This wasn't just your, this wasn't just your, I don't know, your little Johnny, you know, your kid Johnny saying, oh, I'm going to bring a, going to bring a combustion, you know, to a tournament and do well. I mean, he could, he wouldn't do well though. This was like seriously competitive, a lot of good players. This, you know, this, and this basically brought some of the best players from around the world into this one competition. So it was, it was global level just global level uh competition so i just want to put that in perspective 41 people made it to top cut i made it into top cut with an 8-1 record i won eight wins and one loss in this tournament i then did unfortunately proceed to get my ass whooped in my top 32 match because i was being an idiot <laughs> um I feel like open team sheet is a problem for me because I tend to overthink things and that's actually what happened here and that really just caught me off guard and I lost because of that. Yeah. I really, there were so many things I could have done better in that match and it really just pains me to think that, you know, yesterday I could have changed so many things and I maybe would have made it to top 16 or top 8 and maybe gotten on the uh, Victory Road official Twitter. But we'll get there eventually. I think I'll make it to the website because I should they should post top 32 teams. Um, but I made it into top 32, which was just mind boggling to me. I just was like, I just can't believe I made it into top 32. Oh my God. This is like, what? We're going to go look at top cut and go look down, uh, look down, look down. Where am I? Where am I? Uh, I should be somewhere. Okay. I'm clearly missing me. I'm clearly missing myself. Where am I? Cause I'm here. Oh, yo, here we go. Here we go. Here, I got the buy, and I lost to Maddie. Now Maddie ended up getting top eight. Um, he had a really, really cool team. Um, uh, Lapdog Bacon. Uh, he led Reggie Lucky Lapis, just helping handed lightning. Um, and I just lost because of that. I tried to do some crazy outplay. It didn't just didn't work. Honestly, I played really poorly. Um, so I think. It kind of shows that like even if you go eight and one there's still a lot to be learned because i just played really badly in that match my mentals uh, i was just mentally unprepared for that match i think the open team sheet just screwed me up and i i did not recover well going into game two i didn't have a good game plan so it's all things i can improve on uh but we can see maddie actually got was it top eight maddie uh was that top eight yeah yeah one two three four five six seven should be seven eight Okay, what happened here? Why did... Okay. Yeah, it is top 8. Okay, cool. So, Maddie got top 8. So, I lost to a top 8 player. So, I'm, I'm okay with that. I got top 32. Um, but, um, who won Who won the whole event? Susage. Is that, I think that's how you say his name. Susage won the whole event and uh, against Ralph Dude or uh, Paul Ruiz. So, Paul Ruiz made finals. So, you can see a lot of players. Paul Ruiz is a world champion. So... This is no small local tournament. This is like, there are world champions here. There are like regional champions. Some of the best players around the world are in this tournament. Standings, I was able to get top 32. Um, yep, here we go. I went one and one uh, because I had that buy. That buy counts as a one. So I was able to get top 32. I just, I can't believe it. I honestly cannot believe it. 
Uh, I... Honestly, going into this tournament... Hold on. Going into this tournament, I wasn't really expecting to do that well. Because I did the IR Nemesis Tour previously, and I, I, I think I went like 4-3 and three in that or something like that. Not great. So I really wasn't expecting anything well here, anything great. I thought maybe if I pushed myself, I could get like a 6-3 record, a set, maybe a 7-2 if I'm lucky. But going 8-1 just really surprised me. I just played out of my mind, so consistent with the team. If you look at all the top cut teams, we're going to look at the top cut teams. Uh, just so many good players. I mean, Pato, an amazing Italian player. So, so high, but Mufti, a really good player. Juan Fi, a really good player. Daddy Myers, a good player. Navjit. These are all names that I recognize. Mike, one of the best American players. Um, Kokoro, I know is a really good player. North is a really good uh, player, uh, American player. Mr. Penguin, I think he's uh, from Spain, a really good Spanish player. I think he's from Spain. Professor Ragnar, a really good NorCal player. Uh, Manny Morgan, uh, probably the best Italian player. Paulo, I don't know what country he's from. Losada VGC is from Italy as well. Ralph dude from Ecuador. I mean, you're talking skill from all over. Some of the, yeah, just some of the best players. Um, and so I'm just going to kind of be reviewing my rounds. Um, and guess I guess how I did. So, and then we're going to probably end this video. I'm just really happy with this result. I just did not think I was going to get this. And so I just, I was really, really surprised. Kind of going to stop and going 8-1. That really surprised me. All right, so I wrote some notes down, so I'll be going off my notes. I also need water, because holy crap, I'm hydrated. Gamers need to stay hydrated, all right? You take care of yourself, bro. All right, round one, I faced Papan Papa or whatever. And he was running Ogre, Lucky, Zashi, and Kindra, Urchi, and Pharaoh. This was a really bad matchup. The fact that Skinja was not live orb, I was very happy about because if it, if it was life orb, I was probably going to lose. Um, <laughs> that's just, that's just honest. Like, uh, let's just go to brackets, Swiss. Let's type in, I don't know, Control F. And yeah, here we go. So, he, here's here. So I faced. He's he's a, a good Italian player. Uh, but, uh, Kingdra was really concerning because I was using, um, I was using a Zashin Don team and Zashin Don hates Kingdra because Kingdra can reset the rain. And so I can never bring in Don safely. Don can never max safely because Kingdra, because Ogre can come in and Kingdra can just geyser the Don. Um, so it really just created this tough dynamic where I just really, really had to play around, uh, the Kingdra maxing and the Ogre. Uh, it was just a really tough match. I actually lost the first game, and then I ended up winning the next two. So I ended up uh, one and zero. So I was because no, I was surprised. So normally I end, end up losing the first round because I'm just warming up, and then I get into it. But I ended up winning the first round, so I was very happy about that because that was a good start, and that put me in a good state of mind. And I feel like also tournaments like these, especially when they're really long, it's all about mentality. It's all about making sure you don't get tilted, making sure you always play at your best, and understand that. If you take a loss, you can always rebound. But sometimes it's hard when you when you start 0-1. That is never a good feeling because that means that you you think to yourself, you know, if I lose two more times out of these next eight rounds, that I'm not getting cut. I'm not going top cut, and that's a really tough feeling round one to face to have that weigh down on you. So it's more of a mental thing, I guess. So that's why it's always good to start at 0-1. All right. So second round we face Blake. Um, Let's see, yeah, yeah. Second round, we faced Blake. I actually don't remember, like, who Blake was. I was thinking, like, Blake Hopper, but Blake... It could be Blake Hopper, now that I think about it. Um, But it's Typeswig, so I don't think Blake was, like, nicknamed himself Typeswig. So I don't even know who that was. But they were running Aleki, Zashin, Thundee, Lando, Nala, Lunala, and Weezing. And I'm gonna be honest, no offense to you, my dude, but, like, maybe you're a newer player, but... You did really play that sub optimally. I remember he like Dynamax the Lunala when his Shadow Shield was broken and I was just able to KO with a Max Darkness from my Thunderous. Like he really just played that kind of sub optimally. Um, yeah, that's that's really all I have to say about that one. I just went 2-0 versus him.
Man, my mouth is getting real dry. Holy crap. Oh, all this talking. I don't normally... I haven't done a video in so long and I forget how much I talk in these. Holy crap. Wow. I talk a lot in these. Holy crap. Alright, round three. We face Roberto. Now, this was actually a matchup where... Um... I was intrigued. I were... Oh my god, there are four Robertos? Holy... Oh no, no, there's two Robertos. Roberto is from Colombia. He too owed me. He was running Feeny, Zard, Rillaboom, Gren, Zashin, and Caloric Shadow. This was just a matchup that I don't think I was prepared for. Um, and I think in practice, if I practice it more, I could do a lot better. But Zard against my team was just really hard to beat. I almost needed to max Groudon. Uh, but if I max Groudon, he gets a wildfire off of my Groudon. And that does like 80% to me. So I didn't really feel confident in that. It was just a... It was a bit of a rough matchup. And the most unfortunate thing was he was Charty Berry. So even if I wanted to max Groudon, a max Rockfall wouldn't KO and he would be able to survive. That was a really unfortunate thing about this, that he was Charty Berry. I think that was a really good tech because that completely changed the approach of how I... And it completely changed how I played the, uh, how I approached the matchup, because if it was not Charity Berry, I would just try to go Groudon, Dynamax, and live, and maybe go for, like, a lead Groudon and Sun War, so I know I can go for, like, a Fake Out into Zashin and Max Rockfall. If they go for, like, the Max Guard, that's probably the best play, but maybe I can make that prediction, go for a Fake Out Max Quake turn 1, something like that, I think would have been really good. Um, but because he was Charity Berry, that changed the entire dynamic, and he had Grimstone for, for Flex Support. It just made the matchup really tough because that meant Zashin could just, or um, Zari could just go in against my team and I didn't have too much to do to counter it. Looking back, I definitely feel like if I played, if I knew the matchup a bit better, I could have played a little bit better, but just because that was a first, I think that was my only Zard that I faced in this matchup, I need, I kind of understood that my Zard matchup is not that good. And for matters, I think throughout this video, I'm going to say that my Zapdos and my, like, my Zapdos Thunderous and my Zard matchup is not good, so I'm planning on coming out with something that helps versus that, but we ended up losing that 2-0. Round 4, so I faced Mano... Manola, Manolo Rampa, dude, Italian, I'm assuming he's an Italian player, holy, what, Manolo, oh, from Spain, okay, Manolo Rampa, okay, so I faced him, and I was able to 2-0 him, which is perfect, uh, he had a very, very scary team, that, one that I did not have lots of prep against, actually, little to none, dude, my throat's gonna be killing me, by the end of this video. He was running Zashin, Palkia, Incin, Amoongus, and Lucky Lando. Um, so a very like support oriented uh, Zashin, Palkia team, like support the Palkia, allow Palkia to just be the best that Palkia can be and destroy things. Um, supporting it with something like a Lucky for speed control, Amoongus for redirection, Lando for the uh, sun matchup, and Incin just as a general support mod. Uh, I mean, it's just really good why you can see that this team was really threatening to face. I, th I just played around it really well. I made some really good predictions. I think either game one or game two, I uh, played my... Th actually, no, game two. I won game one. Game two, I played my Thunderous really well in actually bringing, it, bringing Thunderous in the back, not maxing it, trying to bait the Palkia Max Quake. I forget into what mod turn one, but bait the Palkia Max Quake turn one. So I switched out to the Thunderous. So I knew I was going to eat Thunderous, eat the Max Quake. And then I knew he was going to go for a Geyser on the Thunderous. So I just went for the Fly, being able to stall his Dynamax. And then Dynamax, um, I think it was like my Groudon or my Ferrothorn or something like that. Um... Dynamax that later on and just do super super well versus it. So um, that was really good. Uh, my team, um, I didn't really say my team. My team is Zashin, Groudon, uh, Instant, Ferrothorn, Charizard, and Thunderous. Um, I thought it was pretty good. I definitely think there's some things I could change, but I thought for the time being. Oh, excuse me. Oh, I'm tired. I don't know what's happening. I thought for the time being, it was actually a really solid team. And I mean, I think I piloted really well. I mean, I feel like you would it would have to be a solid team in order to go eight and one in one of the biggest tournaments in current history. So we ended up two owing that round. So I was sitting at three three one, which three one is good. Don't get me wrong. 
ideally in a tournament like this you want to be 3-1 or 4-0 going into round five just because you always want to keep up those wins because as soon as you lose one that affects your mental state and that can really sway you as there's a lot more pressure on you and it, it, it just gets tough Round five, I face one of my, I call him a rival, Il Mole, Il Mule. He's a really good Italian player. Um, actually, he has a Twitter, so we're going to actually go to his Twitter. Il Mole. Let's see if he has it. Yeah, here we go. Il Mole, a uh, really good player. I don't know if it's blocked or not. Okay, so it's in Spanish, uh, but he's a really good player. Always just high up on the ladder, always as well in tournaments. I was able to top cut a bunch of Mount Silver tournaments. Uh, he was the Battle Royale Holiday Bash winner, which is the one of the tournaments hosted by uh, Colin Iyer, otherwise known as the Battle Room. Uh, this is a pretty big tournament, so I think like 90, 100 players. I was able to get second at the VR Winter Final, and also I think that says E Allo, and third at the Spring Qualifier. So. And he's second, he got second at the Battle Room 4. So, honestly, just a really consistent player. Just able to get uh, top results. Um, and I always face him. I faced him back in the Mount Silver uh, VGG Charity Tournament. I think it was in top 16. Or, no, I think it was in top 4. And it was just a really, really close match. I remember that match like it was yesterday. Uh, actually, I don't remember it like it was yesterday. I don't remember too much about it. I just remember it was a very close match. Came to a lot of close calls. And then I faced him once or twice on ladder um, before. And it was always just really close games. I always, I think I always ended up winning against him uh, in those games, but they were really close games nonetheless. And then I, I lean up to this tournament. I faced him one, once, uh, once again, uh, when he was with his friend testing out a team on ladder. He was like 1500, 1500s and I was able to beat him, uh, which is good. I think it was like 1598. Just a really, really solid player. Always consistent, always good. And so I knew it. As soon as, as soon as I saw this matched up against him, I was in for a heck of a time because he just he's such a good player, plays so well. Um, and so I knew that if I if I you know I knew in this match it was going to go to a game three. Just because I knew he had the ability to adapt, be able to just play well. And that's kind of what scared me in this match because I knew this type of player. I knew this player. And I knew what they were capable of. You know, these other matches, I didn't really know the player all that well. But because I faced Ilmo in the past, I mean, yes, I've won against him multiple, multiple times in the past. But it's still, they've always been so close, Matt. They've always been very close matches. And I mean, while I can win, I can win these close matches and win these wars of like the mind and, you know, making correct calls and whatnot. It's never something that you want to see when you go and you're, you're facing someone in the rounds. For round five. But anyways, he was running a very cool team as Rayquaza, Zashian, Insync, Gestron, Amungus, and Aleki. I was able to take game one. I was able to I lost game two because Sub Zashian kind of destroyed me late game. And then game three, I was able to win uh, by making the ballsiest uh, play and leading Charizard, expecting him to lead uh, uh Rayquaza and Amungus, Rayquaza and Amungus. And he led Rayquaza and Amoongus because he adapted by he adapted in game two by bringing Amoongus and that's how he won. He won the end game by bringing Amoongus game two because he was able to get sleep off and I just wasn't able to recover. So in game three, I figured he would lead Amoongus and lead Rayquaza because I felt like that just seemed like the best option, the best route to take. And so I just completely counter led that, just going all in and hoping that he did that because I knew that it was going to be a tough game and I might as well go for the boss of the wall prediction, uh, turn one, see how it plays out. Also, Zashin, uh, Charizard here also helps versus Zashin. I was just a bit hesitant, hesitant to bring Charizard because he brought Aleki in the past. And Aleki matched up really, really well into a Charizard Zashin lead. Uh, because it really becomes a prediction of do you just go for the obvious target into the Charizard? But if I protect the Charizard and then you go for an electric web, uh, that could be really bad. Or do you just like double down the Zashin? If you do, I just lose there. So it feels like I can't protect either Mon there. But if I don't protect either Mon... Uh, then I take too much chip damage like it, it's a it's a whole thing that I just I really just had to make uh, the correct call correctly turn one and luckily I was able to do it and beat him Once again, so take that actually a lot of good Italian players Actually, I see two Italian players if you see Il Mall and um, H dirt two really good Italian players that I beat to win the uh, Mount Silver VGC charity uh, tournament two really good Italian players Italy is really strong this year. Like they just are so so strong I'd honestly say that 
when we're talking about VGC, I like to say there are three global superpowers, potentially four. Um, there is the United States, there's Italy, and there's Japan, and the up and coming is Spain. Uh, but the United States, Italy, and Japan are the three main powerhouses. Where if you're looking at all, if you're looking at where the majority of players or the, the majority of players' nationalities from top cut is going to be from like Japan, Italy, and the United States. I mean, just look at you. Look at how many ITs there are here. Like, holy crap, guys! Calm down. They're insane. Anyways, round six. <sighs> this was interesting. Um, I faced Jam. Now, Jam is a streamer. I'm pretty sure. So, because I, I I remember hearing his name before. Jam is a streamer. Um, I remember hearing his name before, and I was able to win against him, um, which was very very nice. Uh, I was very happy about that. He was running Zashin, Whimsicott, Ogre, Aleki, Rilla, and Lando. This matchup was very interest interesting. Excuse me. Um, the Zash Ogre matchup, I'm very dependent on being able to play position well, protect well, stall out the Dynamax, and be able to uh, pivot and use my Fair Throne effectively to win the match. That's basically my team. If I don't do that, the Zash Ogre matchup is pretty bad. But fortunately for me, I was able to do that. And against all three Zashi and Ogre teams that I faced in this tournament, I was able to win against all three of them. And Zashi and Ogre, I would consider as one of, if not the strongest archetype right now, um, is just so incredibly good. Like, it's just, oh my god. Guys, it's so good. It puts on so much offensive pressure, has such great synergy, and it's just really, really hard to counter. Um, so I think it's one of the best cores. And so that I was able to win the first one. Lose, I lost the second one, unfortunately, but I won the third one, so that was good. Um, so now we are five and one. And once I hit five and one, I was just kind of like, wait, I'm five and one. That's kind of crazy. Round six wouldn't get easier though, because I faced another really good Italian player uh, by the name of Giampi. Let's see if I have it here. Uh, Giampi. Where is Giampi? You know, I'll just go like here. Hold on. Giampi. Yeah, here we go. Another really good Italian player. I'm telling you, dude, the Italians are just so good. I'd say the Italians probably are better than the Americans at this point. Um, it's really good. I think if we're going to go in a tier list, it's debatable. Number one is Japan, without question. Like, you cannot question that. Japan is just a global superpower. Then it goes... I think it still might go U.S., but Italy actually might just catch up with the U.S. I just think the U.S. is still has a stronger player base just because that's where most of the regionals are held. So naturally, um, a lot more competition. We have a lot more competition and tournaments. So naturally, I feel like we would have better players. But I think Italy is just right behind us. And then Spain. Spain's really good. Uh, but I was able to beat Giampi. Uh, thank you. Well, he said, I didn't play well. I'm very tired. I mean, dude, if he didn't play very well, I'm scared because uh, he was running Zash Ogre, Instant Venu, Dragon, and Grim, and I narrowly won that. <laughs> so I'm concerned if he, like he said that he didn't play well. Maybe that's just him trying to make an excuse for why he lost, or maybe he's just being honest. Maybe he didn't play his 100%. I'm scared to see what his 100% is because, oh my god, this match was stressful. He was running will o -Wisp, Dragapult, which completely threw my entire game plan out the window. I mean, you take how I play the Zash Ogre matchup and throw that out the window and add in a new variable that I need to account for, that I just need to play even more carefully around and pivot even more carefully around and, and just just play, play around it even more, which just led to so many more interactions that I really didn't want to do really didn't want or have to do uh, but because he had will-o-wisp I couldn't just freely allow my Zashin to get burned or my Don to get burned and actually I did get my I did have to have my Zashin and my Don uh, be burned but I think it was okay because I gained some positioning out of it and I was able to win I don't know uh, oh I won game one then he won game two and then I was able to win game three Luckily, I was very scared. I did get very lucky. I think it was either game one or game three. Uh, I think it was maybe game three because I he Dynamax his Dragon Pole and no, it was game one. Oh, he still won game two. I was about to say I Dynamaxed my uh, Zashin and I still or not Dynamax. He Dynamaxed his Dragon Pole. I think I created his Dragon Pole or something like that. Even though I was burned, 
I, I forget I forget exactly what it was. I was I was able to create a move onto his dragon pole that normally I don't think would have KO'd and that allowed me to like open up the floodgates to win the game. So that was really unfortunate, so I'm sorry about that. But also we take those. Let's go boys! <laughs> because um I missed quite a few power whips during this whole uh, tournament, so you know. Man. And that's the last of my water. Ooh. My throat's gonna feel rough after this one, my god. Alright, round eight, we faced a Japanese player that also made cut. Oh, that, that hold on, let's go to round eight. I wonder how many people are still playing that round eight. Like, quite a bit, probably like 100 people. Um, let's see. I'm gonna see if I can try to find my name. I didn't know how many people were playing. Actually, still quite a bit. 162 out of the original 500 people were still playing. Um, but you know, you're also playing, you know, maybe some people just want to keep on playing for the experience Who knows here we go. So this was a very interesting match. I uh, played someone <laughs> uh, I, I don't know Japanese so I don't know how to pronounce that name uh, but they're running Caloric Shadow, Amoongus, Xerneas, Rillaboom, Eleki, and Ensign and this team was very uh, interesting and they played really well with it um, the general, their general strategy was to basically use the Xerneas early game, um, and so use the Xerneas early game set up, kind of standard, but their idea was to have the opponent exhaust as many of the resources into KOing Xerneas as possible, so that Caloric Shadow can come in, pick off weakened Pokemon, get those boosts, and be able to just win the game, because it has a good natural bulk, so it can probably live, it can live a hit or two. It can live a hit. And so that's actually what happened in game one. I hyper focused into the Xerneas without really thinking about the Calyrex in the back. I ended up losing. But then game two, I kind of reassessed the situation and understood that, well, if I just, you know, max my Groudon, get the Spadef boost, and just apply pressure with Ensign, I just win. And I did that game game two. Oh, my throat hurts. Oh, this is going to be rough. <sighs> game three, I... um. I did the same thing. I was looking at their team and I was thinking to myself, well, I know my opponent knows I'm probably going to go for the same strategy, but what can they do about it? And I was kind of looking at their team and they didn't really have much they could do about it. Now, in a scenario where my opponent, in a scenario in which my opponent has the means to adjust to my lead to game three and actually have a upper hand on me, I would have considered uh, not leading the same thing and actually switching it up to try to counter, to try to counter their counter lead against me. But because my opponent didn't really have a counter lead against me, I was just able to lead the same thing and win. So that was actually kind of a breather of a match. I lost the first game, so that kind of, that kind of threw me into a. All right, I really need to assess the situation because sure, I'm six and one. But if I lose this round and if I lose the next round, I'm six and three and I don't make cut. So um, I need, I needed to make sure I still was playing at my best. Um, and f luckily for myself. <sighs> Even though game one, I would didn't play the best game two and game three, I played amazingly. And then round nine was very interesting. Round nine, I faced Professor Ragna. Let me see if I can try to find him. Um, let's see. Okay, wait, I just completely missed that. There we go, Professor Ragna. Uh, Ragna was running Evil Dawn. Um, it was it was actually a really good matchup for me and I was just able to 2-0 him just because I had just had a really 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 good matchup into him. I was just able to 2-0 him easily. He was running like Evil Dawn Uh, Evil Dawn's, uh, or no, no, excuse me, Evil Zosh, Grim, Lando, Rotom, and Instant. The fact that he didn't actually bring Lando made this matchup a lot easier and I was just able to win from there So those are the teams top cut I lost in top 32 Um, just because I just played really bad, but I actually want to go over some of the top cut teams all right, so uh, let's let's do like Victor. Let's go to my profile, and let's go to a uh, Victory Road because I do want to uh, cover some of the top cut teams. I don't know how far we are into this. Probably pretty far into the video, but I want to cover some of the top cut teams. Uh, here are the top eight teams, uh, and so we can see that actually the brackets are pretty interesting. So you can see two two people from the United States made it. Um, one player from Japan made it. One player from Ecuador made it. Two from Italy, and I think that's it. And two from Spain. It was actually a pretty interesting. So, um, Zashi and Palkia won, which is, I think was really cool. Although I think his team is actually really, really good. 
Um, it's very similar to the team that I face, and I think Zosh Palkia has a, a definitely a lot of potential. I think Palkia has such a really good offensive typing for this metagame, and if you can support it right, you can really utilize that to its fullest, uh, like he did here. Um, having Zashin, which also just helps support Palkia, I think it's just incredibly, incredibly good. Um, as <clears throat> I don't know. I think this seems really good. You get the instant, you get the screen support, you get the Amoongus with the Rage Powder. <coughs> Excuse me. I just can't think of a better team. Uh, one thing that I've noticed, we're going to go through, not all the teams, but Zashin is pretty, 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 ugh. Zashin is pretty much on every team. You see it's on 75% of the teams here. Um, Grimstarl has seen a resurgence. I didn't think Grim was going to be good, actually, but it's seen a resurgence. So I guess Grim is here to stay for now, which is pretty interesting. Um, so this team is really, all these teams are really, really good. They are, um, an example of the metagame here. So leading up to the tournament, people realized that Zashin Ogre was significant. It was just amazing. It was just so good. It was just so good. Zash Ogre was, had so many good matchups. Um, and it was just able to do so well into so many things. Um, and you see people are running Zash Ogre here. The Paul and Michael Delangelo are running Zash Ogre. And even Gabrielle was running Sulk Ogre, which is a more bulky variant, but they're also running Zapdos. Zapdos is really good because Zapdos matches well into like the Groudon matchup and it it's a really good Dynamax Pokemon apart from Ogre. Because on that on that team, your main Dynamax option is going to be the Ogre. You can Dynamax Torn, but you don't get that much value out of it. Um, I mean, unless the Torn is a life orb. Um, so having a Zapdos is on the max up and is good. And you can also see Paul Ruiz with the Ferrothorn adaptation is really good. A lot of players were uh, able to use Ferrothorn in this. Um, if you see, if we go to the VGC, if you go to the VGC paste document, uh, Despotory, which I might link this in the description below if I remember, this had all the teams submitted from the tournament. So all, ooh, 532 of them. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, my, my throat is not feeling good. All right, well, we're going to look at Ferrothorn. Uh, Ferrothorn is mentioned. Okay, so the Ferrothorn is mentioned two times per player. So Ferrothorn was brought 44 times. In top cut, Ferrothorn was brought seven times. So you see... Um, Ferrothorn was actually brought a lot in Top Cut, and it was brought a lot on Zashin Ogre. Like, it was brought Zashin Ogre here, Zashin Ogre there, Zashin Groudon. <clears throat> I, wonder who could, I wonder who that could be. The GOAT! Who's that guy, number five? What a freaking legend. What a legend, bro. I'm, I don't... Who's that guy, number five? What a legend. Ferrothorn, number six, Zash Ogre. Ferrothorn, number seven, Zash Ogre. Ferrothorn, number eight, Nala Ogre. But you see, Ferrothorn is really good on Nala Ogre teams. Or on ogre teams i think it's there to help uh with the ogre matchup itself um it also is there to help with like you can go for like body press stuff like that uh it's really good late game i mean ferrothorn has always been good on range just because you can go for like the body press iron defense sets and it can just 1v it can just like 1v3 1v4 so many late games 1v2 so many late games no surprise to see it there you've also actually been seeing quite a bit in cut uh people were pretty surprised by that I was, I was intrigued by that. Yvelto has actually seen a pretty fair bit in cut. Yvelto was seen seven times in cut, which is actually pretty significant. Um, seven times in cut is pretty significant. It has a pretty good matchup versus everything uh, besides Zashin and, um, in the game, so I think that should be no surprise. Uh, but I think Yvelto is here to stay as, like, like not, maybe not the best mon, but a pretty good mon um, as well. Um, but Zapdos is uh, really interesting here. Grim's not really popping up. Popping back up in popularity is interesting to see. Um, being able to get, obviously, those screens up uh, is very important. Oh my gosh, my throat is killing me. <coughs> my, I don't know how much longer I'm going to go with this video. Uh, being able to go for Thunder Wave is, is incredibly crucial. Uh, that way, you know, if you Thunder Wave a Zashin, you can basically render it useless. And one of the things about Zashin that I kind of hate is that when you, when a Zashin faces another Zashin, it's really, uh, one of the most important things is its speed. Um... If you're faster than the opponent's Zashin, that puts you in such an advantageous position. Um, so if you can just negate that and just go for a Thunder Wave and have a chance to fully para and have its speed, so even something like a Groudon or an Ogre can outspeed, that's just absolutely pristine. That's perfect. So uh, uh, Grim Snow is actually really good there. And we saw three Grim and Cut. Rotom, I don't really think Rotom's good 
um, from Hiroto, but I get what Rotom's there for. Rotom's there for the Sun Mirror, so I kind of get that. Kyle's team is very interesting. Calyrex Groudon is something that I'm intrigued to see how Calyrex does. I've been theorizing Calyrex with some of my buddies, and we and we are anticipating that Calyrex does not see much usage in the early stages of the game. We'll start to pick up maybe mid to the form, mid into the format, and we'll be really good at the end of the format. Calyrex is one of those Pokemon where, um, unlike Series 11 or like Series 11 or Series 9, I forget, uh, probably Series 11, you can't just lead Calyrex plus like me and Shadow Unlucky and just win. Um, Calyrex, I feel like to me often is a mon that's a late game cleaner. Um, you often basically waste your um, opponents or stall out your opponents like Dynamax and uh, whittle down the resources for dealing with Calyrex um, by using like your other restricted as a lead and I don't know like a Dynamax mon. And then Calyrex comes in late game and uh, I don't know fires off Life Orb or like Specs, Astral Barrages, probably Specs. I think Specs is like the best set for Calyrex now. Uh, Specs Astro Barrage is just to pick up KOs because uh, as like literally if you can just get a mod to like 60% 60 probably 70% and it doesn't resist it will die <laughs> That's just Calyrex it will die So if you can do that Calyrex is just really good and able to win games so it makes sense why he was able to reach Top four Kyle uh, Kyle uh, North is a very good player Um, But all these scenes are pretty standard not standard, but all these teams are pretty like not as surprising here. Palkia was actually seeing some experimentation and usage uh, before the tournament, and some top uh, level players were experimenting with it. And so it's not surprising to see it win here. Um, it's very awesome to see it win here. I'm very glad that Palkia Zashin wins here because it's it's interesting to see that like the Zashin Ogre team has been pretty dominant for two weeks now. Kind of gets overpowered by the uh, Zashin Palkia. Palkia just has a really good matchup into the Ogre. I think it was a really good medical. Um, but the only issue is with Palkia is that if Zashin runs play rough, that's the only issue because then Palkia kind of says, oh, that sucks. But you have Incineroar for the Intimidate. I think that might have been support Thundy on Paul's team. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure on Paul's team that was support Thundy as well. I think it was support Thundy on Paul's team. I think it was here. I think it was support Thundy on Paul's team. I right, here we go. So let's see. Wait, that's not it. What? Wait, 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 wait. Support. Oh, wait. I'm looking at a different team. Hold on. Paul's team does not have a Thundee. Hold on. I'm looking at a different team. What, what team am I looking at? Oh, no, no. I'm looking at... I want to look at Jesus. I want to look at Jesus' team. All right, where's Jesus? Jesus is like down here. I think he went 7 and 2. I think he... I think he actually used support Thundee here. Oh, no, 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 it's A, okay, 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 so it's AV Thundee, uh, but he does have the Thunder Wave on the gram, so you can, like, Thunder Wave, as, like, you can go and, like, Thunder Wave Azashian and Max Palkia, like, that's also really good, Throat Trap, uh, Giga Drain's interesting on Amoongus, but the recovery is pretty nice, I think just, like, his team is just really solid, and it's interesting to see that, like, over the course of, this is honestly even pre-Series 12, because Series 12 doesn't actually officially come out until February 1st. Uh, but we're already seeing so much metagame development. At first, like, Zashin was everywhere. Uh, Palkia wasn't being used. Um, we saw, like, the ups and downs. Uh, Calyrex was at first used a lot. Um, but Zashin Ogre was quickly figured out as one of the best strategies. And then we're seeing people starting to counter that with Palkia. And we're starting to see people uh, in take and innovate. And innovate uh, the standard Zashin Ogre. And put, like, Zapdos and Ferrothorn on it. Um... We're starting to see like extremely good players innovate uh, teams and honestly, uh, and just making really good teams, aka this guy. I don't know who that could be. I'm <clears throat> just saying. Um, it's just really cool to see. I could talk about this for hours. I don't really want to talk about that much more. I think everything here is to be expected here. I think there are a few unique picks. I think Lapras here is a good pick. That was the Helping Hand Lapras into Life Orb Regieleki, which had just so much potent potential because Helping Hand goes before Fake Out. So you kind of have to guess which one of they, which one he maxes. That's actually how I lost. Um, with uh, I'm talking, I'm referring to Mattia Angelini. Uh, but every one of these teams, like there's a reason. Like I can see obviously why they're here. The only team that kind of surprises me the most is Gabrielle's team. I'm not saying Gabrielle's team is bad at all. I just think Solgaleo, like AB Solgaleo, is something that people were theorizing for a little bit. 
And I was kind of on the fence about it because I think Solgaleo defensively is a very, very good mon. And, but if you're not bulldoze weakness policy, you lose a lot of that momentum. But also it helps improve the uh, ogre matchup if you're AV. And so I feel like he just went in and said, all right, well, my ogre matchup is my AV Solgaleo and my Zapdos and my screen's grim. And I just want Solgaleo to be able to tank those special hits as much as possible. And also, Calyrex's Shadow is not the best, best matchup here. Um, so, yeah, I can see why he's AV. I just think Solgaleo is a bit niche. But obviously, being able to get top four... That's top four. Yeah, being able to get top four in a tournament like this... I mean, in, in one of the biggest tournaments in history, obviously it does bring Solgaleo some uh, validity. And I think Solgaleo will pop up here and there. Do I ever think it's going to be super meta? I don't know. I thought for a while that uh, Bulldoze weakness policy Solgaleo was just going to absolutely wreck shop. I saw it a lot on ladder for like a day. And I really just thought going to Victory Road that it was going to be everywhere. And so actually that's why I went Zard because I needed some uh, Solgaleo counter because I, I expected to see quite a few Solgaleo. But that really just didn't happen. There wasn't a lot of Solgaleo, there wasn't a lot of like Bulldoze, Calyrex, uh, Solgaleo. I was just surprised. I was like, wow, I really didn't anticipate that. But a lot of cool things to see from this bracket. It shows a lot for the future. Uh, it shows a lot for the um, the metagame itself, how it's really developing. Uh, within days, within days, this metagame has developed, new strategies have come out. So it's really cool to see such innovation uh, happen so, so fast. It means also, it also means that you really have to stay on your toes with this stuff. A team that could be good one month ago might not exactly be good now. Uh, but I do think that makes a really exciting metagame. And when we're talking about the metagame as a whole, I think the metagame is very healthy. Out of the the losses that I had, none of them felt like they were unwinnable. Even the Zashi, even the Zard matchup that was my one loss in Swiss, I felt like that was definitely winnable. Now, I did have to... I would have to optimize my play and almost play perfectly, but I feel like that was very winnable. I think that's uh, this format seems very balanced because it feels like not not one team, at least right now, feels too too good that it kind of just pushes down everything else. I feel like everything kind of it kind of works together. I mean, obviously you have some meta teams, but you're always going to have meta teams. You're always going to have like S tier team, like tier one uh, teams. That's that's just a meta, right? But it, um, I think it's important to note that this meta feels very healthy. You can actually use quite a bit and get away with it. You can use Pokemon like Palkia and Solgaleo and get away with it. And I think that's really cool. And even seeing Pokemon like Gastrodon be able to do well, it's really neat. And Rotom and these like niche support picks and be able to get away with it. I think it's really, uh, really cool. And I think this metagame is actually, it just seems really, really healthy as compared to Season 11. So I'm a really big fan of it. That being said, this video has gone on for quite a, quite a while. It's probably been like an, an hour. My throat is literally about to die. Um, final thoughts. Um, I think Series 11, Series 12 is going to be a very exciting metagame. I mean, I'm glad for the extended time that they're giving us. So that way the meta develops fully and we are able to see a sort of complete meta and understand kind of the shifts of the meta. How teams will kind of rise and fall and some charts. I, don't, I think three months is too little for format to be able to experience the full amount. So I think giving us, I think it's seven months, a seven month format. I'm very happy about that. I mean, it also means that like I can keep a team and I don't have to be worried about rules changing um, for tournaments and whatnot. So I'm very happy about that. Season 12 seems to be very balanced. I'm very excited about that. And I actually had a really good start off to the season of uh, Victory Road, Series 12 Challenge. So being able to get top 32 and what basically what essentially is top cutting a 500 player regional. That's basically what this is. I top cut a 500 player regional and this is my uh, little breakout, I'd say. Uh, it's, it's been a while since I've done super well in a tournament. I think the last time I did well was December of 2020, which was the... Uh, Hexa Cup tournament, which had 134 players, and I ended up getting top 16. But it's been a while since I've done anything since then. I haven't really joined many tournaments, so I'm back into the tournament grind. I'm back into the grind. So uh, if you see me, if you face me in Swiss, uh, don't, you know, I'm sorry that I 4 0 you, but it just happens, you know? Anyways, I'm tired. Uh, I'm going to go edit this, upload it, get some water, because you got to hydrate, gamer, stay hydrated. Tell me your thoughts in the comments below on this video if you like the style of video. I know it was pretty long. Um, but I really just wanted to get this out there. But anyways, guys, I hope you all enjoyed. If you did, smash the like button down below and please subscribe. And uh, <clears throat> I'll be back for uh, more content next week. All right, peace.